Interested in video game but don't have time to follow it? Jen Cutter rounds up the biggest video game news in 15 minutes. Just look for it in your DTNS feed. Coming up on DTNS, solar powered cars. Do we want IMAX in our house? And NFT games are fun, but the taxes might not be. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, November 8th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Raffalino. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Shea. There is a longer version of this show called Good Day Internet, available at patreon.com slash DTNS. And we want to thank our top patrons. You can join them there, uh, specifically John and Becky Johnston, Chris Benetow, and Steve Iadarola. Thank you. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Niantic announced the Lightship Augmented Reality Developer Kit, or ARDK, offering tools the company uses on its own AR games, like Pokemon Go and Pikmin Bloom, to developers. These tools include real-time mapping, understanding to help AR objects interact with real-world places, and multiplayer sharing features. The company also launched Niantic Ventures with an initial $20 million fund to invest in AR projects. You know, Apple car rumors vacillate between a product set for release in the next several years to, hey, it's just vaporware, it'll never ship. With that grain of sort of omnipresent salt in mind, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman and Dana Hull's source say Apple hired Christopher C.J. Moore to work on self-driving car software. Moore previously served as Tesla's autopilot software director and will report to another Tesla autopilot alum, Stuart Bowers. Apple's definitely working on a car. Whether we'll ever see, I don't know. <laughs> Read those tea leaves. Microsoft will end support for per personal OneDrive desktop apps for Windows 7, 8, and 8.1 on January 1st, 2022, with users unable to sync content to the cloud starting March 1st, 2022. Files will still be accessible in the OneDrive app, and users can still back up files manually using the web app. But I just upgraded to Windows 7 back when I worked at CNET last decade. <laughs> uh, we learned a little about AMD's Zen 4 CPU roadmap for its EPIC data center processors. That's E-P-Y-C, a data center processors, at its accelerated data center event. These will be built on a 5 nanometer process in 2022 claiming twice the density and power efficiency with 1.25x better performance compared to its 7 nanometer chips. They include Genoa, which will offer up to 96 high-performance Zen 4 cores, DDR5, and PCIe Gen 5, as well as Bergamo, a chip customized for cloud-native applications with up to 128 high-performance Zen 4C, letter C, cores. Genoa is sampling to customers now, set for a 2022 launch, if Zen 3 cores are still your thing, the company also announced the Epic Milan X processors, which used 3D stacked L3 cache to offer up to 768 megabytes of cache per chip with up to 1.5 gigabytes on a dual socket system. These are shipping in Q1 with a preview instance in Azure using the chips available right now. In September, the U.S. Department of Commerce asked global semiconductor manufacturers to voluntarily complete supply chain questionnaires, providing a November 8th deadline. The South Korean Ministry of Economy and Finance reports Samsung and SK Hynix will disclose some data in response, although they will not include detailed info that could constitute trade secrets. TSMC also submitted a response, but said it did not disclose detailed information about its clients. That was kind of a pain point for them, obviously. Micron, Western Digital, and United Microelectronics also made submissions, according to the Department of Commerce. All right. Let's talk about EVs. Uh, if you can't find a charger for your EVs or think EVs are for others because you can't do anything but park on the street and you're like, how am I going to charge it if I'm just leaving it out on the street overnight? Uh, well, Wall Street Journal has a write-up on several startups, including a Dutch startup called Lightyear, that are developing cars with solar panels that can generate enough electricity by sitting in the sun. Dutch startup Lightyear's four-door sedan can get 43 miles of range by sitting in the sun all day. That's enough to go run some errands. You might have to plug it in uh, if you're going to go for a longer trip, but you can do that. It's plug in as well. Aptera Motors of San Diego is developing solar charged two seaters. Uh, these are definitely meant for just running errands around town. The idea of solar powered cars, though, is that they optimize the surface area to collect sunlight and lower the weight and increase engine efficiency so they need less power because you just can't put enough panels yet 
panels aren't efficient enough to bring in all the energy you would need to charge the car. So you're trying to meet in the middle, cover the thing with panels and make that engine so efficient that what you can bring in with the panels will be useful. Uh, the Lightyear One has about 50 square feet of solar cells and a lightweight motor in each wheel instead of a heavier central motor. Fully charged, it can go 440 miles. It's got great efficiency. Uh, the Aptera three-wheeler has 24 square feet of solar cells. It's a smaller car uh, and can get 40 miles of charge in a summer day. And when fully charged, depending on which battery pack you buy, could go 250 to 1,000 miles on a charge. It is not something you'd want to sit in for 1,000 miles. <laughs> uh, Dutch startup Squad Mobility has a golf cart-sized vehicle meant for short-range trips. Uh, I mean, we're, we're talking, you know, golf cart or around the, the yeah, condo complex kind of trips. Uh, maybe run into the grocery store. It can do 12 miles after four hours in the sun. One of the keys to all EVs, solar or otherwise, is better battery tech. And we got news on that as well. Ars Technica reports on a company called SES that is using a heavy salt electrolyte to eliminate the need for graphene in the battery's anode. That lowers the size and weight of the battery and increases the range. Automakers are actually evaluating SES samples. This isn't a like, hey, it's in the lab and maybe someday it'll make it. Uh, SES is partnering with GM, Hyundai, Geely, SAIC, and Foxconn and building a factory in Shanghai that's scheduled to be finished in 2023. And SES hopes to have cars on the road using these batteries by 2025. So, uh, you know, some some good news for expanding the efficiency and the utility of electric vehicles there. Yeah, for sure. And the what's interesting to me is, I, I don't know, maybe before electrified cars were more common, in my mind, it was always kind of like, well, you have to have a solar car or an electric, like there was, there was some sort of distinction there, you know, uh, as opposed to these can all exist and complement each other. Because my first thought, even seeing something like the uh, the Lightway, uh, or the Lightyear car, excuse me, um, that one looks like a regular sedan relatively like it, it's shaped like a standard sedan you know the aptera one is shaped like pretty much every solar kind of concept car that you've that you've seen it looks very you know super hyper aerodynamic three wheels that kind of stuff but even that i seeing that being complementary to okay if you leave this out in the sun you know for the, the full day you can get a usable amount of range it's not going to take you everywhere you need to go but if you had also solar panels on your garage that could have hundreds of square you know theoretically hundreds of square feet to complement that as or you know your whole home is is covered in solar panels and stuff like that uh, you know, letting you get, this is even more than a trickle charge. It sounds like this is a, you know, would be a, a functional amount if you had to park your car on the street or something like that. Again, none of these solve, uh, uh, uh any of the one problem and the, the light year car I know is, is supposed to retail for what, like $175,000 yeah, now, they ain't cheap. But, but that's also like, you know, gen one Tesla kind of money. So we've, we've seen over time that with refinement and with sales, you get people on board, you can, you can finance, you know, theoretically, uh, to, uh, to make those more, uh, uh, affordable over time. And if you combine that with a battery now that you can get twice the, uh, you know, the energy density with all of a sudden now that's, you know, 86 miles theoretically or something that, that wait, that doesn't work out. Solar is different. It's more. Just, but, just say it, yeah, it's, it's, it, but it, it or can you increase. Could have a, yeah. Or you could have a lighter battery as a result because you don't yep. need as big of a battery, which makes your car more efficient. That to me is the exciting thing is like this complementary uh, action between all of these different technologies. Yeah. We're going from, solar is technically possible in a car, but it's not practical, to solar is technically practical in a car, but maybe not for all users. And and so, you know, in a few years, with battery tech improving, like you're saying, from SES, with solar panels improving and getting better at collecting more, uh, you know, we'll meet in the middle, and suddenly we will have a car that can essentially charge on the street uh, if you need it to. It'll never... It'll be a long time. Let's never say never, but it'll be a long time before it matches being plugged in. But hey, if, even if you don't have a garage, if it can charge enough for you to take off in the morning with it and drive it to a garage or mall or your workplace where you can plug it in and charge it off, then that starts to become a workable option for people. Most definitely. Uh, next up here, Tom, we have a we have a scandalous story, and I need uh, your hottest of hot takes on this. <laughs> okay. Uh, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman reports that developer Steve Moser discovered code in Netflix's iOS app that indicates Netflix will have to release each of its mobile games as a separate app in the iOS store and only use the Netflix app to launch the games individually. Can you 
imagine. Compare this to Netflix's current system on Android, where it releases each of its mobile games as a separate app in the Play Store and only uses the Netflix app to launch the games individually. You, you, know, you see sounded, how said the, go ahead. No, I said it different. So because I, mm. I said it like mm -hmm. this for Apple. Now that 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 sounds maybe the same to you, but the difference is really that Apple requires you to do this way, and Android kind of it, it doesn't sound as bad. And nobody likes being told what to do. Think yeah, that's the that. difference, right? The difference here is, and well, Android doesn't make them do it that way. So they're going to change it. <laughs> and someday when they do change it, then they may have launched on Apple and Apple will have forced them to do it in a way that won't let them change it, which means we should get mad now. About <laughs> it. Uh, yeah, no, I was laughing at these stories and and trust me, there's some, some very respectable journalists writing up these stories today. They're like, listen, at some point, Netflix will start including the games within the Netflix app on Google. And then at some point, they'll also launch these games on iOS. And then at some point further down the road, they won't be able to include the games unless they get in. There's a lot of at some point and if going on here. <laughs> but it cracks me up because right now, what they're finding in the code on Netflix is that Netflix is going to do the apps exactly the same on iOS as they're currently doing them in the launched version on Google Play, where they wouldn't have to do it that way if they didn't want to. And at the end of the day, like, given Netflix has an extremely limited game catalog at this point, it's like six games or something. It's 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 a modest Eight, number of games. Five, yeah, 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 it's pretty small. And so like at this point, this is a minor inconvenient kludge to get this to work, but you're still getting game, you know, you're still getting more for that same Netflix subscription. I don't see really any subscribers being like, darn, I have to click an extra button to go through here. It's a bigger deal when you have a huger, a huger, sure. Or do you, you even have, notice when you you go to the tab in the Google, in, in the Android version of Netflix and click on a game, it launches the game. Yeah, it technically launches it in a different app, but does it matter? Uh, like if they were trying to do Stadia, which they're not yet, uh, then yes, it will become an issue. If they're trying to do streaming games, instead of downloadable games. But if they're doing downloadable games like they are right now, you know, yes, at some point it may make a difference, but we are not at that point. Uh, Disney Plus is going to display 13 Marvel movies in IMAX's expanded aspect ratio of 1.90 to 1 starting November 12th. These movies have sequences shot using IMAX cameras uh, in those aspect ratios with Avengers Infinity War and Endgame entirely shot in IMAX. Uh, basically, this means smaller black bars when viewing on a 16.9 TV, offering 26% more picture. The new IMAX uh, launch coincides with the release of Shang-Chi and The Legend of the Ten Rings on the service, which will also get the new look. Now, if you have a projector, I feel like this is good news for you because you can make your screen as big as your wall is, right? If you have a TV, I understand that the black bars are going to be different now with the IMAX ratio, but it also means part of the picture becomes smaller as it, you've got more picture. So, I mean, so, I know it's like pan and scan is not as good, even if the picture's bigger, but is this so better? I, is this better, Rich? Tell me. I don't know. I, I can't decide. So I am generally an AV uh, plebeian when it comes to like, I kind of don't care about HDR at all. I barely care about 4K. This actually interests me because this is like, I, I don't know, like my screen bigger, so it seems like I'm getting more as opposed to like black, like studying black levels and stuff like that. So this actually does interest me. Now this will like, when you're watching non Avengers Infinity War Endgame, this will shift between the 16 by nine and the larger, or the standard aspect ratio and that expanded ratio as depending on what sequence, right? It's not well, gonna be consistent. Well, when they do the it in the time. movies, the, the picture stays the same size, it's just, the tops and bottoms just kind of go away. And honestly, you don't really notice. No, well, because I was going to say, so there's a uh, there's a movie, uh, Wes Anderson film called The Grand Budapest Hotel that changes aspect ratios, con like almost in every little section, it changes aspect ratios to almost like a one-to-one. -one. And unless someone, a film nerd tells you to look for that, you probably won't notice, hopefully because you're invested in it. Uh, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't seen Chang-Chi. I hope I am thoroughly invested in it so that I don't notice it if and when I choose to watch it. Yeah, honestly, um, I can't decide. So look, uh, <laughs> Simu Liu uh, will be this big mm -hmm. if I watch in, in, in regular HD, non-IMAX. And he'll be slightly smaller if I watch in IMAX, but the rest of the picture will be bigger. I think, I, you know what? I think the IMAX is better because you get more picture, even if, because it won't make him that much smaller.
uh, Tom, you, let me reiterate here. Must screen bigger. The screen may, doesn't actually enlarge when you watch in IMAX on Disney Plus. It you stays may the same that. size. You may <laughs> believe that, Tom. You may yeah. believe that. I choose I to believe that they're expanding the size of my TV and All right, Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, folks, join in the conversation in our Discord. Uh, is your screen getting bigger when you watch Disney Plus? Let us know by linking uh, your Discord to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. <laughs> Now, if you're one of those people who is still thinking NFTs sound like a pyramid scheme, uh, this story is not going to mean much to you. But if you've moved into the, okay, I can see a few fun uses for these, maybe especially in games, take notice. NFTs have created a play-to-earn business model. Yes, there's issues of pay-to-win, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about people who get paid to play. A lot of these companies do that. You play not just for fun, but also to get paid by the appreciation of an NFT that you buy. The NFT gets more valuable. Uh, and some games are even giving you in-game cryptocurrency the longer you play. You're like generating the currency as you play. Uh, this is, in fact, what caused Steam to clarify its policy against blockchain-based games that issue cryptocurrencies to players. And then Epic's immediate like, but we'll take you, come over here. <laughs> Whatever your opinion, NFT gaming is a multi-billion dollar industry right now. People are buying and selling digital items in games like Axie Infinity all the time. And Protocol points out that under current law, and even more so under the new Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act uh, that was just passed in the United States, those game transactions where you buy and sell an NFT are taxable as securities trading. That's right. If you sell your plus 12 magic sword, it's subject to capital gains tax. Uh, I mean, if you sell it for more than you paid anyway. <laughs> And actually, if you hold on to it for less than a year, that would be short-term capital gains, which is taxed at a higher rate. Ah, you sold the NFT for Bitcoin, you say, and then cashed out the Bitcoin. Yay, two taxable events. You get taxed on both of those. You didn't get around it at all. Uh, man, those roads are going to get so paved thanks to your tax dollars. So keep on playing, folks. Uh, even swapping NFT items in-game could have tax implications. Protocol also noted the idea of getting people to play games on behalf of NFT owners in order to raise value. <clears throat> so you grant what are called scholarships in the industry. Hmm. You cut those people in, like you're gonna play, generate a bunch of cryptocurrency for my account, <clears throat> and then I'll share some of that cryptocurrency with you. That's subject to a business tax because you're essentially contracting them. Uh, scholarships usually involve people from overseas so it's a foreign business arrangement, which trust us does not make it less complicated. And honestly, the system isn't built for any of this. Games don't yet keep tax records. It's on you to record and report your transactions. And unless you're forced to, game operators won't want to do things like collect ID and maintain tax, writers, tax records because that's too much friction for a game. But it's still the law and it could constitute tax fraud if players don't follow the rules. Plus, it may have implications on the games themselves. A player may want to sell you a magic cloak, but delay in order to make the capital gains implications more favorable, which is not your usual game dynamic, Rich. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've seen we've seen like real world economics at play in, in games like, uh, you know, World of Warcraft or any number of games. But like this is like a, a next level, like waiting for I got to wait 365 days before I could sell this because otherwise I'm going to get murdered on my tax rates. Uh, you know, this does make me wonder, like at first when Steam announced they weren't going to be doing the NFT gaming thing, I was like, oh, OK, it's just like it's a new marketplace. Maybe they don't want to get some bad publicity if some of these games are you know not like high quality or scammy or anything like that well, no i also think maybe now reading this that they didn't want to touch you know having to do these tax reportings with a 10-foot pole ultimately though you know we, we kind of heard these same warnings uh when you know there was you know when crypto exchanges were in a, in a lot of infancy where it was like you know you, you have to keep in mind i mean there was no uh, IRS guidance for any of that, first of all, like for years. And then when there was, it was a realization that's like, oh, I need to know like how much I bought this at, you know, how much I sold it at, how long I held it, that kind of, you know, like very basic stuff now. Uh, but So I, I can see this over time, there is a market incentive, right, for <laughs> game companies or game developers or, or, you know, whoever is the publishers of these not to make 
a player's life a living hell at tax time. So I feel like the 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 games that can do that will be better valued by their customers, at least in the long run. Uh, so like, not not to say that everybody was just kind of figure this out. The good news here is that at least according to the protocol, it's not like this is a point of emphasis for the IRS. Now, I'm, I am in no way saying anyone should avoid paying the taxes that they owe to of any course. sovereign government. Please pay your taxes that you owe. However, if this is confusing to you and it's accident, you know, you accidentally don't pay something or something like that. It's not like the IRS is like gunning for this where they put out a crypto advisory, uh, I think it was a year or two ago, where they said, you need to be on top of this because we are going to be looking for this as a point of emphasis for us. So uh, a fascinating world to 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 think, OK, we're, we're calling these you know NFTs uh, as securities. And, and increasingly, uh, again, under that new infrastructure bill, that's laid out in law now. Uh, there's a, some ambiguity about what that actually means, uh, but uh, could definitely make these games a lot more complicated. <laughs> At least they're text yeah. I, I had a front row seat as Patreon went from uh, you, you, people pledge money and we give it to you <laughs> to uh, there's tax implications to this. So we're going to start collecting some tax information on you. Don't worry. It's all on our end to we have to collect sales tax and VAT now because we're big enough to be on people's radar. So I think that's what's going to happen here. None of this is really going to be a, a, a big issue for most people uh, until one day it is. Until one, you know, an enforcement agency, whether it's in the U.S. or elsewhere, says like, all right, we're going to start cracking down. They'll go to the businesses. Uh, the businesses will say this is burdensome. It doesn't work. We need new laws. There'll be a bunch of sturm und drang. And eventually they'll pass new regulations that give the gaming industry its own system for collecting taxes. Because here's the thing. When the Internet requires a new system like net neutrality or something, Nobody wants to do it. But when that system impacts taxes, governments do it really fast. Uh, because if they're like, oh, this system isn't helping us bring in the revenue as fast, we'll fix that. So this will eventually get fixed. It's just a matter of when. It's it's called a motivated actor at that point, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, and next up here, WhatsApp began rolling out multi-device support as a default feature. Uh, it's kind of been a, a big news. We've been following the development here. It was added to the stable version of the app earlier this year, but users still had to opt into the multi-device beta program. It was in there. You just had to opt in. The feature now lets users link up to four non-phone devices and doesn't require a primary smartphone to be connected to the internet to use. That's a big pain point for a lot of people that you know wanted to leave it up on their computer or something like that. The rollout of default multi-device support just might encourage you, though, to leave that open in a browser tab or on your tablet or something like that all the time. You know, like you would for, I don't know, an app like Discord or Slack or something like that. But, you know, it's kind of a, it's a you know, it's an apples to oranges comparison. You know, WhatsApp doesn't quite work like either of those apps. Maybe not yet, though, because WhatsApp beta info reports what XDA developers had found hints of back in October. And that's that a community feature is in development for WhatsApp on Android and iOS. This would let community admins manage effectively groups of group chats, including the ability to send community invite links. Uh, WhatsApp beta info compares communities to something like a Discord server, which individual group chats uh, within those communities acting like a Discord channel. So you wouldn't have maybe access to all of the, the chats within your community, but you would have the ones that you would be interested in. The admin would oversee everything. WhatsApp beta info notes that community icons appear to be squares with rounded corners, a format that WhatsApp mistakenly enabled and then quickly disabled back in October, uh, you know, that that lines up really, you know, if one of these two pieces on the other, obviously the multi-device support, just a big deal in terms of if you're a WhatsApp user, convenience of, you know, just not having to have your phone on uh, all the time, uh, especially for like travel and stuff like that, being able to stay connected like other apps like Signal and stuff can do. Uh, but, you know, combine that uh, uh, kind of a sneaky backdoor, uh, you know, kind of a more sophisticated group chat feature maybe a, a future uh, path for growth for whatsapp for sure yeah it's kind of a chicken and egg right like i know there were lots of reasons users wanted multi-device mode because when whatsapp started it was like yeah i just use it on my phone uh but then as android and ios and everybody started to have these you know when microsoft added it the ability to like oh it's nice to get my messages on my desktop everybody wanted to be able to do that with whatsapp so multi-device support was important to the users but what else could WhatsApp do with that? And what's the business reason for doing that besides just making users happy when the users really aren't paying anything for WhatsApp? <laughs> uh, and uh, this this could be it, right? Yeah, there's there's a weird thing where, you know, like Discord and, and Slack are like 
sometimes can be good organizational tools for like corralling people into the right groups to communicate with. But sometimes as chat tools, especially when it comes to things like threading and stuff like that, can kind of fall on their face at times. I, I'm not a, a regular WhatsApp user. I have like two chats that I'm ever in uh, with that. So I can't speak to like, I, I, I'm not an expert at the efficiency, but if you have like a really great chat experience that can be expanded to be like a organizational productivity kind of thing, uh, that might have a ground up, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, emphasis on it that could be appealing. And WhatsApp's trying to make their money off businesses. So yeah, having crazy. having a business version of this, you make it popular with regular users and then have business versions of it that they can pay to get different analytics or bring in customers for things. I can totally see that. All right. Uh, do we have one more story, Rich? Yes, we do. And it's it's truly close to my heart because if Microsoft's ArcMouse has always seemed like something approaching greatness, but stopping tragically short. Microsoft may be working on your ideal travel mouse. An international patent spotted by the German tech site Windows United shows Microsoft's idea for a mouse with a deformable body that includes an expandable shell on the top and motion trackers to communicate tactile input. Yes, a folding mouse. In other words, it stays flat. Slip it in your laptop bag easily and you can bend it more than your typical mouse you'd be able to. Uh, Microsoft says in the patent that current travel mice lack an ergonomic design and may be uncomfortable to use, which I find kind of odd because I know some people say the Arc mouse is not exactly the most <laughs> comfortable mouse to use. But maybe if you can, if it's like fully formable and you can really kind of contour it to how you want to use it. Tom, are you are you lining up for a fully foldable mouse? So so if I'm understanding you right, the Arc mouse is the one that's kind of kind of like a, a top curve. of a triangle, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so this one is flat. The mouse itself is actually flat, which would be useless as a mouse, but you pull it out of your bag and you just bend it into the arc shape. And now you can use it as a mouse on that very small tray in your, in your, in your airplane seat back. It, I okay, mean, it, you're it, probably it, using it in the lounge, but still, yeah, you use it on the, it's, it's using a go. This is genius actually, you know, it, it folds like, I, I like weird Microsoft productivity, like, like, you know, everyone's like the vertical mouse. Okay, we're doing that. Microsoft's like, no, no, no. We're this mouse. We're folded in half. You can like business traveler guy. We got you or gal. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Absolutely. Andrew wrote in with a nomenclature question on Meta. He says, I had a quick question about Meta platforms and how we refer to it versus Facebook on the show. My original assumption was that with the name change, when something changed on Facebook, it would be reported as Facebook has decided. If something was then outside of the Facebook app, it would be reported as Meta has announced. I've noticed a couple of times on the show when talking about Facebook, you are saying Meta and not Facebook. So when do you decide to say Meta is doing something versus when Facebook is doing or announcing something? And then uh, he, had, uh, he had also uh, said he can kind of compare this to reporting on something that Google has done, but not mentioning Alphabet. Yeah, so Alphabet is pretty easy. With Alphabet, you have very distinct companies right? Alphabet rarely does anything. Google does stuff. Waymo does stuff. DeepMind does stuff. Uh, so so it's pretty easy there. With Meta, you, you don't have company divisions. That's one of the big differences here is like Meta is just changing the name of the parent company, but you're not creating a Facebook company that is below Meta. You've still got Facebook, WhatsApp, you've got company divisions, but it's not the same as Alphabet, which actually has like corporate structures than CEOs for each of the divisions. There's no CEO of Facebook separate from the CEO of Meta, at least not yet. They might do that at some point. But uh, so, so what's going on here is I have to decide when to say Facebook because that means it only applies to the product Facebook. But when it's the company doing it, I say Meta because that's the overall company. And in fact, in the case, uh, I, I asked Ansi B, I, I wrote him back. I was like, okay, what, what, what is the example you're seeing? And he pointed out that we had said Meta is shutting down Facebook's facial recognition system. And, and he, Andrew was wondering, like, well, if it's Facebook's recognition system, wouldn't you say Facebook's shutting it down? A, there is no Facebook to shut it down. So you could kind of go either way. But also, in the press release from the company about this, they wrote, in the coming weeks, Meta will shut down the face recognition system on Facebook. So I just, I'm like, oh, they are saying we meta are shutting, are making the, the decision to shut this thing down in our product called Facebook. So I know this is getting kind of in the weeds here, but that that's the thinking that goes between this. And it also is a nice way to illustrate the difference between Alphabet and why we say Google differently than we might end up saying Facebook, because you're talking about two different structures, two different situations. 
Absolutely. And if you have any other thoughts on that, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Happy to uh, talk about that on the show. And thanks to our brand new bosses, Samir Tartir and Di Morgan Henwood, who just started backing us on Patreon. <laughs> Thank you, Samir and Morgan. Truly, truly appreciate it. Yeah. This is a uh, th this is a, a nice nice streak we're on. Please don't let it end. If you, if you're on the fence out there and you've been thinking about jumping in and supporting us, now's the time to do it because you'll get a holiday card. Uh, we're mailing holiday cards to all the patrons who give us their their address. So get in there and do that right now. Patreon.com/slash/dtns. That's you, Rich. Oh, okay. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Patrick Norton. Always a good time. See you there. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. You have enjoyed this broker. <laughs>